Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to this to this uh, uh, session. I I hope we have uh, I hope we have fun with it because there are people out there who are who are having fun and are engaged with these issues. I flew in this morning from Durban and. Um, I was waiting to uh, board in, in Durban, and there were two ladies. One of the Durban papers uh, has written this story. It's following up on a story that's been current here in South Africa. And it's about um, all these stadiums that you see that we built for the 2010 World Cup and all these highways that we've built. And, and it's about collusion of the construction uh, firms, alleged collusion of these construction firms, um, in the building of all these, um, of all these stadia. And, um, and all these, uh, 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 and, and some of our airports, and how they cut up the business between themselves and said, you take that one and I'll take that one, I won't go into competition with you on that one and so forth. So these two ladies were reading the, the newspaper and they kept on saying, gee, wow, do you know, so many billions of rand, so much money and so forth. And then, and then you know, and I was, uh, I was eavesdropping, it was very rude of me, but uh, sometimes you have to do that. Um, and I was, I was standing there, and then one of them said, ah, well, you know, they are rich people, nothing's going to happen to them. And that's, that's the conversation that's going on out there. It's accountability. How do, you, how do you make people accountable? How do you make states accountable? How, you ma how do you make all of us accountable? And it's also governance. Governance is, is politically challenging. It's very hard. How do we make sure that post-2015 um, we, we can actually push this, uh, this storyline forward? How do we make sure we hold people accountable and, and hold our governments, make sure that they, they actually um, follow up on the things that those two ladies uh, this morning were talking about? So I think, I think for all of us in here, it's, uh, it's, it's incumbent on us to uh, have a robust discussion, but also to bring in other voices. I hope that this is not going to be seen as um, um, a UNDP discussion and the panelists need to answer questions. It's also about us, about the people uh, we've left behind, about those two ladies. If those voices populate this discussion, then I think we'll have, uh, we'll have um, succeeded. Um, I just thought I should lay down some rules uh, for this session. Um, it's going to be short and quick. We're running very late. We're supposed to start at uh, quarter to two, so we're an hour and a half late. Um, um, all of you here have read, I'm sure, the briefing papers. There have been consultations, as all of us said, all over the world, uh, on, online and so forth. Um, we don't need to go over the conversations again and again. Please, let's try to push it forward. Let's give constructive uh, and robust uh, inputs, but we don't have to repeat everything that has been said. Um, before. Um, some mobile phones have gone off uh, while I was, uh, uh, while Olaf was speaking and the other speakers were on. Uh, kindly, please, I beg, um, switch them off. Um, it's, uh, we all need to get maximum value out of this session, and so it would be uh, very nice if we, if we can concentrate on that. Um, we have a fantastic panel. Um, um, there's four panelists plus Olaf. I've been asked to ask you to uh, come back up. You've already uh, had an input from Olaf, and so you, you will get over and above the two days you're going to have with him. Um, you also get to uh, add on uh, with him on the panel uh, with us. Um, our first um, Panelist is uh, Ms. Geraldine Fraser Muleketi. Uh, she's well known to us here in South Africa. She is the former minister here in South Africa for public service and administration. She was a member of parliament from 1994 to 2008. Uh, amongst other things, Geraldine has also been a member of the management board of the Commonwealth Association of Public Administration and Management and has represented South Africa on the executive committee and governing board of the African Training and Research Center. Um, our second panelist is Masia Tran. Masia is an international lawyer, political scientist, and manager serving as director of the Research and Right to Development Division at the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. The division develops policy and uniforms and informs office positions 
on thematic human rights issues, provides advice and content for advocacy at headquarters and national levels, and forges interagency partnerships to integrate human rights in the work of other UN forces. It also carries out capacity strengthening activities to improve human rights promotion and protection, including on the right to development. Our third panelist is Ignacio Saiz. Ignacio is the executive director of the Center for Economic and Social uh, Rights. Ignacio was appointed uh, executive director of CESR in 2009 after having served as the center's research director since 2006. Our fourth panelist uh, should come down any minute now is, is Rosemary Zulu. Rosemary is assistant program coordinator of Restless Development. Um, since 2008, Rosemary has been the Assistant Program Coordinator for Restless Development in Zambia. In this capacity, she works on youth-led programming and advocacy training, capacity building, advocacy, civic participation, project management, HIV prevention programming, and gender mainstreaming. Um, I'm going to ask first um, Geraldine to uh, give us her presentation, and after that, um, we'll get into questions and answer. I'll, I'll introduce the rest of the speakers as they come along. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justice. He says I'm well known. I think he's well known as well, and you've seen he's uh, uh, already given us quite a tough framework, which is reflective of his columns as well. Um, I'd like to join all the previous speakers, and this is the panelists earlier in the day, um, in thanking you uh, for joining us from around the world um, and representing a wide constituency um, in attending this important consultation on governance. I'd also like to take this opportunity to extend a hearty welcome to those uh, who are joining us, the virtual pa participants who are joining us on the live stream from different parts of the world uh, today. Now, reflecting on the robust discussions that we had this morning and over the past week, uh, hosted by the Pan-African Parliament, UNDP, UN Millennium Campaign, Accord, Third World Network Africa, and the Tax, uh, tax Justice Network, I must say that I am inspired by the rich uh, debates that have taken place, and I also feel a bit rejuvenated. Um, not suggesting there's anything wrong with uh, uh, where I am at this point in time, but I think it's, it's because we are having uh, discussions that are advocating for a transfer, uh, transformed and redefined notion of governance as well as development, which acknowledges and affirms the centrality of uh, democratic governance against the backdrop of, drop of human rights. I'd want to kick off uh, by stating up front that I believe that the strategic significance, uh, what I believe is the st strategic significance of democratic governance for sustainable development is firstly that it is a critical enabler for socioeconomic transformation and the improvement of the lives of our people. The story that Justice told, and, and what he didn't say, and I'll say it here, um, Justice says, you know, your language and jargon is quite dense. I was reading something on a blog that you tweeted, and really, you know, almost got a headache wading through it. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm hoping that I'm not going to aggravate that, but I'm going to borrow one or two terms anyway. <laughs> I think there's adequate evidence uh, to demonstrate that democratic governance may not be achieved, as stated this morning, under conditions of uh, absolute or excruciating poverty, profound inequalities, and ever-rising unemployment. And I think this was stated very clearly this morning. There was also a reference then that even under conditions of uh, fast economic growth, that as was pointed out this morning was even acknowledged 
by the UN system and, and, and in instance, uh, some of the Bretton Woods institutions, um, that it may not anchor socioeconomic development on a sustainable, in as sustainable a manner as, uh, as intended. And we saw this through the Arab awakening or the Arab Spring. Um, it's been amply demonstrated. I think secondly, democratic governance is a critical prerequisite for sustainable peace and political stability without which sustainable development may not be realized. And this is a demonstration that political freedom go together with both economic and social freedom. And third, given the above uh, observations, I believe there's an emerging consensus. And uh, I can speak uh, immediately following this, uh, the African consultation that concluded yesterday, that in Africa what has come up as an emerging consensus, that for democratic governance and sustainable human development to be achieved in tandem, there is a need on the continent, and it may go for elsewhere, to engineer and re-engineer what is now com commonly referred to as the democratic developmental state. And this is the kind of state that I think Professor Saul alluded to as well. A major feature of the governance consultations is its inclusive and participatory approach to ensure that all people, including those with limited or no access to intergovernmental and related processes, are given the opportunity to deliberate on issues that affect them. It's about all our lives. It's not about some people who have greater access than others. This is about ensuring inclusivity. And I think this has been raised um, repeatedly as well. And the consultations that have taken place on governance over several months, and we've seen people from across global regions, from Asia to Latin America, Africa to the M Middle East, um, um, demand for more responsive, responsible and legitim legitimate governance, uh, governments and governance, mind you, effective institutions, citizen participation, accountable and transformative leadership, and better service delivery, but also when talking about uh, service delivery and improved service delivery, also about quality service delivery and inclusive and sustainable development outcomes. So I'll talk about three more things because uh, justice unfortunately doesn't take any prisoners and uh, is not referred to me as honorable earlier, so even less chance, so let me see what I can do in the time given. Kicked off by the African Regional Dialogue in October last year at the Pan-African Parliament and followed by a meeting in Brasilia, Cairo, Philippines and, and, and Bangladesh, um, complemented by an expert meeting on measuring governance and human rights commitments in the post-2015 agenda, something my colleague and fellow pan panelist Marsha will describe uh, um, in, in greater detail, we saw this as quite an ambitious endeavor to try and take this process forward. And as Olaf said, this is a new step for the United Nations. And I think even for the peoples of the world, it's a bit of a challenge. And Aruna, Devaki, and others this morning challenged us and said, so where is this going to go? Devaki claimed to be out in the cold, uh, you know, coming from outside. And when we all listened to her, we knew she was an insider in terms of the ideas not in terms of necessarily a groupie or something like that. And, and what has come through in the discussions has been amongst others, and I'm not going to lift everything. Parliamentarians, civil society, and academia emphasize the centrality of governance to sustainable development. They spoke about the structural, social, and economic transformation required taking into account capacity development needs of both people and institutions for governance at different levels. So Mike, not just global governance, national governance, 
or regional governance, but also local governance. And I know you're dying to raise the whole issue of urbanization and local governance and where we're going to. This came up in the discussions. And there was a view that it ought to be considered that we need to look at the centrality of governance to sustainable development and consider it in these terms at the different levels. At the other end of the governance spectrum was the discussion of global governance and both their role in dealing with critical transnational challenges and also the need to ensure the democratization of international processes. There was a further debate and discussion on national and natural resource governance and ecological justice to mention but one of the sub-themes on a topic as wide as governance. Now it's not possible to reflect on all these themes and shed light on the legal relations and sometimes manipulated policy and institutional environment, my, uh, environments. But the earlier consultations emphasized the need to rethink economics, development and economics, and we heard uh, Devaki and uh, Professor Sal on this, this this morning, as well as the critical role of a capable democratic um, developmental state, an empowered civil society, parliaments that will hold um, the executives and all others in society accountable, a vibrant media, social movement, labor unions, faith-based institutions, and, local and, inter and the local and international private sector, um, well, transnational um, uh, corporates and so on. There was also a call for by indigenous peoples that their issues should not fall off the agenda and that this needs to be considered as we move forward. And again, we have uh, stakeholders from the indigenous sectors present here who take it forward. So a lot of this uh, came up. There was also a call for empowering marginalized, marginalized social groups such as women, youth, people with disabilities and minorities, as well as building and nurturing political space. Now on this aspect, some participants, and this is on the discussion across the various regions, raised the importance of allowing space for the institutions of accountability to fulfill their functions. And this is to the national human rights institutions who are present here today, and other institutions that have this function to ensure that there is a responsiveness to deal with the challenges. They noted the important role of parliament, and I'm emphasizing this again, being in this people's parliament here, as a critical check and balance and a fundamental element of the governance structure that must be allowed to fulfill its important functions, but also claim its role and take, it, take that forward. And coupled with this was the need to restore legitimacy and trust in institutions to reform in, uh, existing institutions and to create innovative new ones, to create robust public, uh, robust public discourse on the norms of democracy and to draw comparative lessons from the global south. Now, as expected, there were disagreements and there were even tensions in the debate among participants. And one of the key issues that arose was whether we need a single development agenda given the oscillating trends and the dichotomies between countries and sometimes regions. And I couldn't present it better, what came up in the debates, than the way in which Devaki challenged us this morning and said, should this really be done? And this is what uh, this consultation is about. So against this, it will be challenging to have a common UN agenda strong enough to mobilize resources, determine priorities, engender united actions of the international community. There were also varied views on whether the MDGs have promoted coherent and intersectoral approaches to problems, or the extent to which the MDGs could be said to have been a good planning tool. 
And that's why we need to look carefully as we move forward on how we take this forward. What is the next set of tools? And I want to say, as I conclude, Justice, and I'm going to step back now, that this consultation presents us with a unique and, opportunity, uh, and important opportunity. <laughs> because it's no longer a question of the centrality of governance in the new development agenda. Rather, it is a matter of how the notion of governance is reconfigured and transformed to the many challenges. As my son would say to me, is it something that I can explain to granny or gogo and they can tell the neighbors what it is that we are discussing? And that's what we want to do. So we're not the wise people up here. The wise people are in the room and on the virtual network and all the gogos out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Fraser Mulekit. You made it within. <laughs> you made it within your 12 minutes. I'm, I'm going to ask Masia to come up now and present. Thank you. <laughs> Justice, thank you for your very kind introduction and good afternoon to to all participants, colleagues, and friends who are here. I'm going to continue along the same lines as Geraldine already put in motion, and that is to highlight the key themes and trends that have already emerged from the regional consultations and, and the e-discussions uh, that have taken place. And I'm going to move onward. Geraldine has quite comprehensively uh, addressed what the discussions have said or, or, or uh, pointed to in terms of governance. And I'm going to link that then with accountability. And as was mentioned, the discussions across the region so far have brought out one thing very, very clearly. And that is that governance isn't just about ensuring that a country's administration functions smoothly. It's also about how people can review what those in power do and how they can hold the powerful to account if something goes wrong. And along the lines that Ariel Arroyo from Peru raised this morning, accountability is really at the core of governance. If there's no accountability, governance would simply be an empty concept. So when I say accountability, accountability for what? And the next question that came up strongly in the different forms of consultations and discussions was, what are those in power accountable for? People gathering for the global consultation in Manila, in Cairo, and those submitting ideas from behind their computer screens kept stressing that countries have already recognized priority concerns of people across the globe. They have agreed on international human rights standards, uh, principles such as the right to food, the right to education, the right to political participation, and it was reiterated that human rights standards and principles need to be the basis and framework for accountability in a new development agenda. In other words, people have argued through the consultation so far that human rights should serve as the yardstick for people to assess policies at the national and international levels and as well the coherence between them. So the recommendations and, and questions so far on, on, on these issues have been many. Um, and, and perhaps I'll move from the notion of accountability, what accountability means, to what this actually means in practice. How can we make sure that within the next global development framework, people can review progress and can seek redress if commitments have not been implemented. And a few suggestions have been put forward during the consultations already. And I'd like to summarize those suggestions, those ideas, in three broad points. First, what would a new agenda commit to? Aside from stressing that the new commitments should be based on and in line 
with human rights standards, it's been emphasized that the time frame and the level of ambition for commitments needs to be consistent with an objective assessment of the maximum available resources of a country. Countries take off from very different starting points. So what is a minor commitment for some will be a huge one for others. This could mean having global goals, but targets and indicators that are adapted and adapted to the maximum of what an individual country can achieve. Second, another big question, who needs to act? Once new goals have been agreed by states, it needs to be clear who is responsible for achieving them at all different levels. The question was raised, for example, whether in addition to governments, other powerful actors um, such as transnational businesses should be accountable for achieving progress or at least for not causing harm. And it was recommended in this regard that the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights could be used to address the effectiveness of existing corporate social responsibility schemes. Third, uh, and a hugely important question, how can we measure progress? It was stressed throughout the consultation so far and across regions that there needs to be an effective way to report on progress and to take action based on whether there's progress or not where measures have had little or negative effects. So let me elaborate just a little bit on this point since a lot of interesting questions and suggestions have already emerged around it um, during the consultations. For example, some people asked, what can and should be measured? The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pile, mentioned, as you just heard in the video announcement, the tendency in 2000 when the MDGs were formulated a tendency to treasure what we measure instead of measuring what we treasure. This meant that key areas of governance, such as personal security, political participation, access to justice, which were seen as rather hard or difficult to quantify, were not included in the MDGs. And contributors to the consultations, these global consultations so far, stress that unlike in 2000, many of these governance dimensions are now measurable and could well be included in the post-2015 agenda. In addition, a global agenda can also generate incentives to collect and analyze more data for example, data on prohibited grounds of discrimination, such as gender, ethnicity, national or social origin. Thus, more aspects of human well-being can be measured. And another question that was raised was that in a new framework, we should not just measure the outcomes, but also the efforts that are taken by duty bearers to reach those outcomes. So for example, are relevant laws and frameworks in place? What are the budget allocations that have been made? And so on. Now, next and, and uh, almost my last point is the question about what should be the mechanism to track progress? There was a clear call during the, the consultations for the new development framework to build on strong accountability mechanisms, ideally ones that already exist. Um, Aruna Roy mentioned this morning regional uh, mechanisms, for example. So there are existing mechanisms at different levels, and some of you represent those, those mechanisms. But let me just mention, for example, at the global level, the Universal Periodic Review Process, the UPR. 
as well as the UN special procedures, such as special rapporteurs, independent experts, there's one uh, with us um, during this meeting, working groups of the Human Rights Council. These uh, mechanisms are already in place, and they can and, and could be used to help track progress on the next um, iteration of, of global commitments. The UPR process represents a system of peer-to-peer -peer monitoring, which effectively um, encourages um, exchanges between governments. Um, it's an accountability, uh, an accountability system. It encourages governments to achieve results. So the existing regional mechanisms mutual accountability systems between governments and donors. These are other ideas, suggestions, examples that were put forward as were administrative, judicial, political accountability mechanisms and parliamentary processes that Geraldine has already spoken about. And in addition, there were several very innovative social accountability mechanisms uh, shared, including local public service delivery pacts, social audits, village assemblies, consultations, referenda, and so on. And of course, we can't fail you know, in this millennium to mention information and communications technology. Crowdsourcing, mobile technology, social networks, these are also seen and have been proven to be very effective accountability tools. So now, let me end uh, and finish this, this um, highlighting of the issues, the ideas that have come up with a pragmatic point. And it's one that came up quite prominently in the governance consultations, um, as well as in some of the other thematic post-2015 consultations, the ones on other topics. And I'd like to share it with you as I conclude, because I think it might come up in a number of our discussions in the round tables and, and also spill over um, until tomorrow. And that question is, what do we do with all the many issues that so many people are concerned about? How can we avoid ending up with a huge, long wish list that's too difficult to communicate, and that was Geraldine's final point, and importantly, way too complex to implement? The reality is that whether we like it or not, we're going to, member states are going to, need to prioritize. And the question that came up in the consultations was, how do we make sure that we undertake that prioritization process consciously, conscientiously, and objectively? In other words, what criteria could we use to prioritize the goals, targets, indicators, including governance and human rights variables. As part of the e-consultations, a number of criteria were discussed uh, between policymakers, civil society actors, and, and statisticians. Um, and, and in a way, this heralds the start of a very important part of the conversation that we're having here and that's being had in so many places uh, of the world around this agenda. So in a way, the consultations, including what, what we've done here this morning, have generated probably more questions than answers. And while we certainly won't be able to provide answers to all these questions in these two short days, I think we can and we should become quite practical as we go about our discussions. We should aim for concrete suggestions and recommendations that we can submit to member states and to others who are going to make key decisions on the post-2015 agenda. I think we all agree, and that's why we're here. This is an unprecedented opportunity and a responsibility, so I hope we can go forward in this collaborative and constructive spirit. And I certainly look forward to our continued discussions. Thank you, Marcia. I'm now going to call Ignacio to come and speak to us.
Thank you, Justice, and thank you to, uh, to the organizers for this opportunity to, uh, to be here with you uh, over these two days to discuss these uh, vitally important issues. The Center for Economic and Social Rights, uh, my organization, has been working for, for the last 20 years on the relationship between poverty and human rights, and we're working really to, bring, to try and bring human rights into the sphere of economic and social policy. Um, and it's for that reason that uh, we became engaged, or have been increasingly engaged, in the post-2015 discussions uh, over the last three years. Um, I have to say that we, we probably fell into the camp, our NGO fell into the camp of those who disliked the MDGs, uh, as I think uh, is the case with many uh, human rights organizations, at least initially, um, because we didn't see them as closely enough aligned to, to human rights standards, and therefore a missed opportunity for uh, bringing about human rights accountability. Um, but nevertheless, we saw that the discussions around what should replace them as a golden opportunity to shape a new uh, development agenda, uh, uh, to build a new framework that was more consistent with the values of, of human rights and human dignity. So it's in, for that reason that we have been engaged in a number of ways. Uh, we've been working for the last two years with, with the Office of the High Commissioner precisely on the issues of accountability and human rights um, that Marcia just uh, spoke to. Uh, so because she has spoken to them so eloquently, I'm actually going to focus on uh, the, the uh, key threads and issues which have emerged in, from our perspective in our capacity as uh, members of Beyond 2015. Uh, CSR, um, for the reasons I mentioned, became actively involved in the Beyond 2015 campaign. Beyond 2015 is a, uh, a forum, a coalition of some 570 civil society organizations in over 95 countries, or in about 95 countries, a very heterogeneous group of uh, development, social justice, human rights, uh, environmental organizations, and, and individual activists. Um, and we have been engaged uh, on the post-2015 agenda and specifically on this issue of governance precisely because, as was so eloquently said by Aruna Roy this morning, from our point of view, poverty and inequality are not accidents of fate. They're the result of specific policy decisions and power relationships which are discriminatory, exclusionary, and unjust. So, Poverty and inequality are underpinned by injustice. Now, governance, for us, from our civil society point of view, describes the institutional context in which power and authority are exercised, the context in which public affairs and public resources are, are managed uh, in ways that can either, on the one hand, fulfill people's human rights or deny them. It's for that reason that uh, we coordinated an internal consultation process within the Beyond 2015 network, together with our partners, the Global Call for Action Against Poverty, precisely on the issue of governance, in order to channel input into this UN consultation. And so I want to share with you briefly um, the five key issues or threads that came up in the course of that consultation uh, around the, the dimensions of what we see as civil society organizations are the, the, the key pillars, if you like, or core dimensions of what we describe as just governance in, and, and what this means in the post-2015 context. Just a few seconds on each of the five dimensions. Firstly, you won't be surprised, human rights. Uh, I agree, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Aruna, uh, who said this morning that governance has everything to do with human rights. We too, and there is consensus about this within Beyond 2015, um, we too see the end goal of sustainable development and of good governance as being the realization of human rights. And by that we mean the realization of all human rights. As you know, human rights is sometimes understood restrictively. Uh, for us, it includes economic and social rights, the right to food, housing, water and sanitation, social security, rights related to the environment, the right to a healthy environment, as well as civil and political freedoms, um, which are equally crucial to the eradication of poverty. Uh, for us, economic and social rights, are particularly, and cultural rights, are particularly critical uh, in order to, to act as a kind of normative framework for bringing governance into the economic and social policy sphere, as was, as was described this morning, needed to be done. 
Human rights, uh, from our perspective, links, would, would, sorry, linking uh, the new framework to the, the existing framework of international human rights legal commitments would reflect the fact that ending poverty, uh, as Nelson Mandela said, is a matter of justice, not a matter of charity. And so for us, uh, the MDGs, we dislike them because they undercut existing human rights standards. And it's absolutely imperative that the goals, targets, indicators across the board that are, that are chosen for the new framework must be formulated in ways that align with the provisions of human rights standards and certainly do not contradict them. And we, we've been developing proposals for that, that, how that should be the case, but I want to leave the issue of human rights there. Second key issue, equality. As has been amply said, the MDGs did very little, the current MDG framework has done very little to address uh, different patterns of social inequality. They're very extremely weak on gender inequality, kind of reducing gender inequality concerns to, to political participation in education uh, and, and issues of maternal health. Uh, they're practically blind on issues of uh, discrimination and inequality on grounds of race, disability, as we heard this morning. And so, uh, as together with our coalition and outside it, groups uh, working for the rights of, of, of different populations are organizing to ensure that the new framework really does tackle the discrimination that underpins and fuels inequality. Uh, and proposing ways in which the goals should not just uh, be sensitive to inequality, but should actively seek to reduce disparities. And, and that's, a, that's a, a, a critical point. But more importantly, on the issue of, of inequality, we feel that the framework really needs to address socio-economic inequalities. Now, even on the issues that the current MDGs contemplate, uh, for example, child mortality, we've seen widening disparities, even though there's been progress at the aggregate level. When you disaggregate, there are widening disparities on grounds of income, in t uh, child mortality. General progress, but uh, according to UNICEF figures, the majority of countries where there has been progress, there has been widening inequality between the top and bottom quintile in terms of child mortality rates. Um, and also in terms of income disparities, for reasons that we all know to do with the, the impact of the, the global financial and economic crisis, we've seen um, hugely widening income disparities at the global and, and national level. And really, we've, we've seen that in many parts of the world, uh, industrialized, developing, emerging uh, countries, uh, we see government for the 1%. Uh, this is a critical governance issue that we feel um, the, the new framework must address. It must focus on the factors that fuel inequality, such as unjust taxation policies at the national and international level, which was mentioned by Ambassador Bordon uh, this morning, um, and, and the many other sources of inequality uh, whose roots are often in, in policies that are set in the industrialized world. Third point, participation. Uh, again, a lot has been said about this, so I'll just uh, um, echo that uh, the Beyond 2015 network is absolutely adamant that those living in poverty have to be seen as the, the have to be the subjects and agents of, of development and have obviously a right uh, to participate in the decisions that affect their lives. Their voices and concerns must be front and center in debates about the post-2015 framework, not just in the design of the framework, but also how that framework is monitored and, uh, and, and fulfilled. I want to say here that very often these discussions about what the post-2015 framework should include often involve you know, experts, including sort of NGO experts. The real expertise is the lived experience of those experiencing poverty and deprivation. And so that expertise needs to be, needs to really be valued. Um, okay, I'll move on. Uh, I have more to say about that, but I'll move on. Uh, number four, transparency. We've heard uh, very eloquently this morning how access to information is a key element of open and responsive governance. For us, just to, so as not to repeat what's been said this morning, for us a critical issue around access to information is access to budgetary and fiscal information. Where are resources going? Who's benefiting? How fairly are resources being generated? Back to tax again. Uh, the future de global development partnership, whatever replaces MDG8, really has to address issues, for example, of financial secrecy and how that enables mass scale transnational tax evasion that is depriving developing states of critical development resources. 
um, the latest figures uh, estimate that the amount lost in global tax evasion is more than four times what was spent on overseas development assistance in 2011, just to give you a, a, a sense of the scale. And fifth issue, no surprises, accountability. Um, we've seen how uh, accountability has been the biggest, one of the biggest shortfalls of the post-2015 agenda. There's been a, a clear lack of incentives on states to, to comply. Um, accountability has been weak because of the, the monitoring and reviewing mechanisms or lack of real implement, uh, monitoring, lack of effective accountability mechanisms. Accountability has been diffuse, a lot of emphasis on shared and collective responsibility, less, uh, less assumption or identification of the specific differentiated responsibilities of different actors at the national and international level. And accountability, I would argue, has been skewed. In other words, where it has been invoked, it tends to be invoked in terms of the uh, donor-developing uh, country relationship, in other words, the, the, the accountability of developing nations to, to their donors, rather than the accountability of all governments to, to their people and to those experiencing deprivation both within their borders and, and beyond. And so um, our, uh, our campaign is, uh, has, has looked at, is passionately concerned about how accountability plays out within the state, below the state, because there are big issues around decentralization processes and how that affects accountability, but also critically above and beyond the state. Um, there's a particular concern uh, in civil society circles about the lack of accountability of powerful governments and international institutions who shape the global policy environment on, on, on issues ranging from uh, financial regulation, illicit financial flows, trade, investment, etc. I would refer you to the, uh, to the latest MDG GAP task force report, which looks at um, progress in monitoring MDG 8 commitments. Um, you, you could almost rename it the, the G8 taking to task force in the, in the sense that it, it really hammers home uh, the, uh, the, the, the gross abdication of accountability and responsibility by G8 countries and, and also international financial institutions for um, really creating a, a global policy environment that is conducive to meeting development commitments and human rights goals. So this is something that for us the success, successor framework absolutely has to address Framing international cooperation not just as a matter of overseas development assistance, but also the do no harm principle, ensuring that global policies do not actively contradict uh, the, the steps that are needed, that states need to take to fulfill uh, the new development commitments. Uh, and it may be at the global level that new mechanisms of accountability are needed. I think there are existing mechanisms at the national level that can be better used for uh, post-2015 monitoring. But at the global level, there's an absence of mechanisms to monitor, for example, the responsibilities and accountabilities of international financial institutions, uh, the, the G20, G8, uh, what mechanisms do we need there? And we, we, I think we're going to talk tomorrow in the round table about accountability mechanisms here. And lastly, uh, access to justice issues as part of accountability. Um, we heard uh, about the life-saving power of, uh, of claims for so of social rights claims under South Africa's constitution. I think it was Navi Pillay who, who mentioned this. Um, ac the access to justice of people who experience poverty and deprivation and, and who need to claim their rights is absolutely critical, and the, the impediments facing them uh, absolutely should be addressed in some way by the new framework. So to, to summarize, these threads, these five threads of discussion were woven by our campaign into a, in what we see as a new vision of governance post 2015, a vision of governance which is rights-centered, which is equitable, which is participatory, which is transparent, and which is accountable. Uh, and our position paper, the Beyond 2015 position paper on just governance, um, which talks about these six mutually reinforcing dimensions, um, is available on the governance uh, consultation website as well as on, on the Beyond 2015. Um, two, uh, t three brief final points. Um, it's, we do feel as a campaign that the, this needs to be a universal framework, universal in terms of its conception of rights, so universal in terms of rights and who has rights, and universal in terms of responsibilities, by which I mean um, it must more effectively address 
the, the specific responsibilities of those global actors that I mentioned, or actors affecting the global policy environment. Uh, so in that sense, a universal framework of responsibilities, but also a universal framework in terms of who has rights. It must address, this is our feeling, it must address poverty and inequality across the globe. It no longer makes sense to have a framework that is divided into these increasingly meaningless categories of North and South. Um, the country of my nationality, Spain, is a country that is experiencing galloping rates of poverty uh, in, the, in, the, in the wake of the financial crisis and the austerity measures that have been imposed in the country and widening inequality. That to me is an issue that must be addressed within the post-2015 framework and I don't just say that because of the country of my passport but because um, it makes absolutely no sense to have uh, a non-universal framework. So global goals, we, we also feel there should be global goals, but very much tailored to national realities. And so it's how that, that tailoring and that taking into account of the different resource levels that Marcia mentioned, that's uh, absolutely critical. Can I make one final point? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Am I overstepping my time? Um, so the, the critical issue is how to inscribe these principles in the new goals, and I look forward to, I, I hope the discussion from here on will move towards that, that specificity. Um, there, is, there are as many views within Beyond 2015 as there are voices on, on the how, uh, you know, even on questions, should there be one standalone goal on governance or human rights or accountability? Our feeling though, and I think this, this consensus can be teased out, is that on the one hand, governance, human rights, equality, accountability are cross-cutting concerns that, in, that have to be, they have to be, run across the whole framework of whatever, and there are concrete ways in which that can be done, disaggregating all the goals to track how disparities are being reduced, creating sector-specific mechanisms for accountability under each goal, so there are some, some uh, action points, if you like, that are cross-cutting. But there are other issues uh, or blind spots in the current framework where there may be an argument for the specific inclusion of a new governance-related goal or target or set of indicators. And some were made earlier around uh, um, you know, open budgets and budget transparency. Um, uh, you know, others that have been suggested are around uh, political participation, for example, birth registration as an indicator for um, evaluating um, questions of pol political participation, uh, freedom of information, violence against women as a critical um, indicator relating to security and governance. Um, the critical thing for us is that those five dimensions of just governance that I mentioned find themselves reflected in some way. We may not be proposing specifically how that is done. Um, we recognize that the new framework has to be selective, um, but we would, we would say that clear criteria do need to be established for making that, those choices, and those criteria themselves need to be rights-based. They need to be informed by the provisions of human rights. There needs to be a balanced agenda uh, that is equality sensitive, that boosts attention to overlooked issues, uh, and that certainly is not made uh, contingent on whether data uh, and indicators are already being monitored. We, we believe very much that um, if we treasure something, then we should find ways of measuring it if, that, if there aren't currently ways of doing so. My final point is on human rights. Uh, there is consensus amongst the civil society groups uh, represented in our ne uh, network or campaign that uh, there's a consensus demand for human rights to be a central pillar of the new framework. And that's been noted, uh, particularly that came out in the consultations around Monrovia, uh, the, the high-level panel meeting in Monrovia, which, uh, where they reported a resounding call for, for human rights to be integrated. But I mention this because we may all be in agreement, perhaps, but at the intergovernmental level, we see that there are some governments, and not just governments, uh, who say that human rights and accountabil accountability and these issues of governance are too controversial. They're too much an interference in domestic political affairs. Um, you know, some are arguing that uh, it would be better to bury or subsume the language of human rights into more palatable concepts such as rule of law. Um, now, I understand where that's coming from, given the history of the, the misuse of human rights and governments, governance issues in, um, in for example, in, in, in relations between donor governments and, and recipient governments, uh, and the whole linkage misuse in, in, in the context of aid conditionality. One can understand these sensitivities. But the point I want to end on is that the demand for human rights, 
for a, for a truly transformative vision of rights-based governance is far from an ex external imposition. It's a demand from within. From the, the ongoing pro-democracy protests in Tahrir Square in Cairo to the anti-corruption or freedom of information activism that we heard about in India to the indignados of uh, Madrid's Puerta del Sol, there is a popular clamor for more accountable governance which has arisen in all continents uh, over the last decade and it's using the language of basic human rights. That's been echoed by progressive world leaders and the high-level panel itself, Grasa Michel, uh, um, most recently, I think in Monrovia, uh, said that lasting peace and sustainable development are impossible without respect for human rights and the rule of law. So I would say that to those governments who, seek to, who are seeking to take governance off, or governance and human rights off the post-2015 development agenda, that they are seriously out of touch with their citizens, that they risk undermining two decades of progress on the so-called rights-based approach to development, and quite frankly, they risk being on the wrong side of history. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. There's, there's so many issues that, uh, that have come up. I, I look forward to the panel discussion. I'm, I'm now going to call on Rosemary Zulu to give us her input. First of all, I'd like to uh, extend my heartfelt appreciation to the organizers for giving me a youth or rather young person an opportunity to, only, to not only represent myself, but represent other young people or, or rather youth, both in Africa and across the world. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I must say that um, it's always, some people say it's challenging to be the last speaker because there are a lot of wise words that has been said, so you have to really um, speak better for people to get your last sort of recommendations. Others say it's a very easy job because almost everything has already been said, so you just have to conclude. But I hope and try that I'll be able to represent um, my fellow youth and young people are well. Imagine a global agenda that is led by and through the world's largest demographic, young people. Imagine young people immersed, leading, and influencing the biggest conversation of our global generation in a meaningful, positive, and progressive way. As a result, imagine a world that reflects the need of, is defined and monitored by half the world's population from the grassroots right through to the global level. This is the world we want. Young people are a growing demographic majority. 87% of young people live in developing countries. If you must ask, in Zambia, we have more than uh, half uh, of Zambian population. That is about 68% uh, young people, or rather youth. And in developing countries, they are disappropriately affected by their community and world's most pressing problems. More than 30% of 15 to 24-year-olds in the world live on less than $2 a day, and yet young people remain isolated from decision-making processes, frequently overlooked as a resource for change and development. So I hope that my presentation, I'll be able to uh, share some of the best practice of how we've involved young people as we are dealing with this issue of empowerment and participation to, in, to tackle inequality and promote uh, social exclusion. So I'll be able to share some of the best practice that have involved young people and how they've um, contributed positively to, to the development of uh, Zambia. Too many people do not have access to services, education, training, and support that they need and lack knowledge, skills, and opportunities to gain or even challenge power. Unable to uphold the right to information, government accountability and transparency remains weak. Young people can and must help to fulfill these gaps. In the context of and beyond the post-2015 global development processes, monitoring is fundamental to youth empowerment. As such, Restless Development and More Ibrahim Foundation seek to pilot and develop a viable, replicable small-scale model to address the critical gap in approximately six to eight African nations over 18 to 24 month period. 
So, uh, so you know, Restless Development has been trying to strengthen governance in the post-2015 uh, framework by, lead, by, by making sure that young people lead uh, through the words, um, through the different discussions that they have at national level. For example, we've been trying to hold a national conversation uh, or on the post-2015. Like in Zambia, we just had it two weeks ago, where young people from different um, backgrounds, for you know, a lot of people, for example, in my nation would have different perceptions about young people. Others will say, you know, you're not very educated, so we can't include you. Others you say, you know, you're an African, or they'll say, you are, for example, in my nation, if it's in a rural area, they'll say, you are young and you are female, so we can't really involve you in different um, decision-making processes. So we tried um, as much as possible to involve young people from all walks of life in Zambia and just um, share their views or create for them a platform where they can actually interact with each other and come up with concerns, issues, and what they thought about the post-2015. Um, the post And I'll be able to share with you some of the recommendation that we got, not only from Zambia, but from other countries where the national consultations were held. So as the population most affected by poverty, young people should be at the forefront of shaping monitoring shaping, monitoring the global development framework. Young people's ownership of the next global framework will ensure the next generation of leaders who have the capacity and commitment to drive development. The following have emerged from the youth consultations globally. So some of the findings include uh, the findings of youth consultations on the post-2015 should be seriously considered by decision makers in the mainstream process led by the UN and member states. The next framework should align with the international human rights agenda. I'm sure you, the issue of human rights has been mentioned a lot. That is a right for every young person to participate in different issues that affect them. And I believe that if young people, for example, are the most hit by different social injustices, then it makes sense that they're involved at every level of decision-making processes. That's why when I was starting, I expressed my heartfelt appreciation because I was given an opportunity to speak as a young person, and obviously all the issues that that affect young people will be able to represent. Obviously not all of them, but at least um, as a young person I'll be able to involve, uh, represent other young people. And also um, national government must own their development programs and shape uh, context relevant development objectives in consultation with their citizens. Young people's involvement should be documented and will be critical to the credibility and relevance of these objectives and measures of governance and accountability. Obviously, young people, one of the things that came out strongly in the consultation we had in Zambia is that young people are supposed to be capacitated, or rather supposed to be um, empowered in order to um, hold their so sort of local government to account. For example, they, they mentioned the issue of lack of information. You'd find that most young people don't have access to key documents, policy documents that affect their lives. So they don't even know these documents and they don't, they're not even empowered enough to hold their, their local government to account. So if that's the case, then how do we expect them, for example, to hold their local governments to account? In turn, how do we expect to have accountability if there are no citizens who can hold their local government to account? So um, measures of government, uh, governance and accountability. As a population affected by poverty and young people, like I said, should be at the forefront of shaping monitoring, delivery, and progress against the goals. In the next um, framework, national government should commit to specific and measurable governance and accountability objectives, including spaces and structures in place for involving youth and youth-led organizations, targeted policies and budgets for youth engagement, accessible information and communication of development programs and progress, capacity development of civil society organizations and effective and engaged government institutions. Also open and accessible data on agreed development indicators to enable young people and their organization to play a central role in holding national government and international community to account. And obviously the issue of disaggregating data has already been said. Disaggregated data by age and sex to improve the participation of young people, especially young women, and strengthen the monitoring of development impact for most marginalized and excluded groups. 
And um, I believe uh, young people, like I said, have a big role to play. Being, for example, in Zambia, being the largest uh, population of about 68 percent. If young people can be involved in tracking the progress of the development goals, then definitely, you know, the, 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 the country can, can develop because young people will be in the forefront of holding their local government or leaders to account. And I believe that young people need empowerment, and some of what they need is access to information and access to different skills that can help them to hold their government to account. Like, for example, in Zambia, we, some of the, maybe I can share this best practice. One of the things that we do is uh, we work in sort of rural communities where our access to information is quite difficult, where our technology is not very um, easily accessible. So what we do is we recruit young people, train them, build their capacity in advocacy, and um, uh, share with them the key um, development documents that we have as a nation. And we ask them to go in rural areas and recruit groups of 15 young people. And they build their capacity um, in those, you know, in the skills of holding their local government to account, and they avail to them the key documents that they're supposed to know about, you know, how development should come about in their communities. And what they do is um, we try as much as possible to create a platform between um, the local policy makers or decision makers and young people and provide that environment where young people can actually hold their, for example, members of parliament to account. And one of the things that happened in one of the communities was the young people gathered themselves up and we had other young people to build their capacity, those that we trained, and they invited the chief different headmen and the members of parliament. And when they were there, they were able to access VCT kits. That's, that is voluntary counseling and testing kits. Because they, there was one clinic in that community and you know the, the government has been big at you know voluntary counseling and testing, but in that community, in as much as young people, or should I say the community as a whole, wanted to go for voluntary counseling and testing, but there was there were no kids in that community, so it didn't really make sense to encourage someone to go for voluntary counseling and testing when there are no kids. So young people, with the support of their other young people, their capacity were built. They came together, called the member of parliament and told them they, what their issue was. And um, you know, they were able to you know, demand for, that, for those kids. And it was interesting how the member of parliament said for the first time he was approached by young people and he had no option but to commit and say, I'll be able to you know, bring the kids to your community. And we found that it was also interesting because the young people had the capacity, were empowered enough to follow up on that. And after a couple of months, that community received the VCT kits, which was a plus. And um, I'm here to say young people you know, should be involved in monitoring of the, the next 20 or uh, the post-2015 uh, agenda because one, we are the majority, two, we have the energies. So if you can build our capacity, then definitely we'll be able to channel our, uh, our positive energy in the right direction. And um, as an organization, Restless Development, we've been trying as much as possible to um, provide that in, uh, environment for young people to participate. Like I said, one of the things that we've done is we've done more than 12 national consultations, so that obviously young people don't give an excuse that you don't have a plat platform to participate. So we tried to, pa to provide that platform for young people to come together, share their different experiences, talk about different issues that they affect, come up, or come up with recommendations, and we try as much as possible with the support of other organizations to consolidate a report of those almost 12 uh, national consultations and see how best they can get to the um, UK, to U UN uh, high-level panel. And also to help other sort of countries that wanted to start the conversation on sort of youth participation in this post-2015. We came up with, with the support of, uh, support of other uh, stakeholders. We came up with a toolkit that can help them come up with, uh, that can help them facilitate a national consultation. And also we uh, facilitated, we played a key role in engaging young people at the global um, consultation and at the high level panel that was held in Senegal, in London I mean. So we mobilized a few young people, built their capacity on how they can engage effectively. So I believe that for us to tackle the issue of inequality and promote social inclusion, we need to recognize that young people are the majority. We need to recognize that young people, if well are capacitated, can help us you know, to uh, monitor uh, the progress of the next uh, development agenda, apart from that, to hold you know, local government to account. Thank you so much.